The dinosaurs didn't know extinction was coming. They carried on romping and stomping as the sky turned to fire and that meteor took out much of Mexico. In a similar vein, without anyone at Aston Martin has been brave enough to tell the venerable vanquished that it's living at the far end of an overdraft of borrowed time. This is a car that sits on an architecture that already has been replaced and which is still powered by the gloriously anachronistic naturally aspirated V12 that Aston has been using for nearly two decades. But while the new, turbocharged DB11 is an empirically better car by almost any metric you choose to employ, it can't match the exclusivity of Aston's range stopper. Buyers who opt for the Vanquish will have to find an extra $80,000 to get a car with less equipment and less power than its supposedly junior sister DB11, which costs only $214,820. But they will find themselves at the pinnacle of Mount Aston. It's impossible not to see the continued appeal of this grandest of grand tourers, a car that makes a Bentley Continental GT look like something bought at Sears. Now, the Vanquish has been given a final freshening in the deployment of the S badges that Aston reserves for its ultimate incarnations. The Vanquish S gets more power, although the increase must be well within the margin of variation of the known S's engine. A fractionally freer flowing intake system aims to sharpen the top end in the 5.9 liter V12 and takes the output rating up 12 horsepower to 580 horsepower. Still 20 horses less than the new twin turbocharged V12 in the DB11. Strangely, Aston claims a higher, 595 horsepower output for the engine in European spec, although it says the engine is in the same state of tune and offers no other explanation. Close to screaming. None of this really matters. The Vanquish continues to have a naturally aspirated Aston Martin the 5th-12 that is one of the finest engines in the world. It's special from the moment it fires into noisy life with a leonine snarl. Most automakers who still produce V12S tune them to sound soft and creamy, but the Vanquish S's engine is loud and often angry. Its character shifts with both revs and load, sometimes yowling and sometimes, when closing in on its 7000 revolution per minute limiter, close to screaming. Yet it doesn't quite manage to deliver a corresponding amount of fury. The Aston is certainly fast. The company claims a 201 mph top speed and a 3.5 second 0 to 62 mph time, 0.3 second brisker than the stated acceleration time for the non-S Vanquish. The last standard Vanquish we tested sprinted to 60 mph in 3.6 seconds. Yet it lacks the almost instant lowdown urge that comes from turbocharging, which many similarly priced competitors now deliver. The big engine pulls cleanly at low RPM, but it needs to be worked hard to truly deliver, and Aston claims that power peaks right at the 7000 revolution per minute red line, 350 revolutions per minute higher than in the standard Vanquish. The upside of natural aspiration is that throttle response remains scintillating in the standard 8 speeds the F water box had been retuned to shift with more aggression. Changes made to the Vanquish S's chassis, although modest have had a greater, and counterintuitive, effect. Spring rates have been stiffened by 10%, these on top of the 10% increase the Vanquish was given in 2015, and there's also a bar on your rear anti-roll bar and firmer suspension bushings. Yet expectations that this toughening will increase the hardness of the Aston's core seem off the mark, it actually feels noticeably more compliant than before, riding out bumps and rougher road surfaces with impressive disdain. We're told the broad and bandwidth should be mostly credited to a smarter algorithm controlling the Bilstein adaptive dampers, allowing them to react more quickly. Still big but nimbler. The Vanquish S still feels big, but it can be hustled at an impressive pace thanks to high grip levels and accurate steering responses, which have also benefited from the suspension sharpening. The steering has gained some weight over the non-S Vanquish, although with no loss in feel. We're still not keen on the squared off steering wheel, though, what's wrong with round? Driving on cold and greasy English roads revealed another advantage of the engine's relative lack of low-down torque, the Vanquish manages to find impressive traction where turbo rivals would be battling their traction control systems. Aerodynamic modifications have also reduced front-end lift at speed, 
Aston says this falls from 146 pounds to 40 when traveling at 150 miles per hour we had no chance to confirm this. Inside, the hand-finished cabin continues pretty much as before, with beautiful materials and elegant design mostly distracting occupants from the reality that there really isn't very much to play with. Aston's HVH architecture means that plenty of the stuff you'd find on a mainstream car costing a tenth of the sticker on a Vanquish S just isn't there. There's no adaptive cruise, blind spot monitoring, or automated emergency braking. Would James Bond care? Also, the navigation system has been upgraded from the dreadful 2005-ish Volvo system that Aston previously used to something that could be accurately described as half-decent. Trying to quantify the Vanquish S by rational criteria is an exercise doomed to failure. It is more expensive than the DV11 but is also much less spacious, slower, and with much less equipment. Offered in the coupe form we drove, $297,775, and also as a convertible volante, $315,775, that we haven't experienced yet, it's due in dealerships come April. It is still hugely desirable and the car perhaps sticks closest to the values that made Aston great. We will miss it when it departs, but the grand old dame is going out in style. Few auto companies manage to produce such consistently good-looking cars as does Aston Martin. Barring the strange decision that was a Signet, a Cyan IQ minicar with an Aston grille, it is becoming increasingly hard to remember the last time the British sports car specialist turned out something that wasn't either handsome or gorgeous. It's a streak that the new Vantage, set to go on sale early next year, definitely isn't going to break. Mechanically. Little about the new car will surprise anyone familiar with its predecessor, although there have been some notable changes, chief among them the arrival of a new, Mercedes-AMG sourced, twin-turbocharged V8. But the design and mission both follow the same path as its long-lived predecessor, a car that managed to look remarkably fresh even at the end of its 12-year lifespan. This Vantage will continue as Aston's entry-level model, being both smaller than the DB11 coupe and pitched more as a sports car than a grand tourer. But the Vantage has been designed to deliver more than just straight-line speed, being the first Aston Martin to get a new electronically controlled locking differential that is touted as being much faster acting than a conventional mechanical limited slip diff. Torque vectoring also will be standard. While we'll have to wait to confirm it, Aston promises that the Vantage will feel more responsive than the already keen TB11 V8. The Vantage offers potential Aston Martin buyers big savings over the DB11, with the $153,081 base price undercutting the DB11 V8 by just under $50,000, more than enough to buy something nice with more seats if you need such a car, too. Of course, there will be many ways to inflate that figure. Factory options include a tack pack that adds blind spot monitoring, an active park assist system, power adjustment for the steering column, and blast switch gear. The comfort pack will bring 16-way seat adjustment and seat heaters. Then there are the nearly unlimited paint and trim options available via special order. Customer deliveries of the new Vantage will begin next spring.